Welcome to the Echo Cast, episode 139. We're going to call this one The Division 2 in Hindsight. Very grand. You'll find out why. It might not be expectations, but that's uh, that's up to you to decide. This is a podcast about the Division franchise, its community, news, speculation, and updates about the games. I am Bond Diesel. I have done Division stuff for years now, such as this podcast, Twitch streams, and YouTube videos. Please take a moment to subscribe to and rate the podcast on whatever platform you listen to it on. If it's on YouTube, please leave a comment down below. You can even just say, for the algorithm, whatever suits your fancy, but feel free to ask questions or give some feedback down there. This episode, we will do a big, giant Division 2 in review, some first impressions of other games I'm playing, some content updates, and more. I want to thank this month's Patreon supporters. If you want to support the podcast and any of the other stuff I am doing, you can check out patreon.com slash bonddiesel. Um, in the content updates, I will talk a bit more about content and what will be coming in the medium to long future um if you pay attention to my twitch and stuff like that you'll see that i haven't streamed in quite a while um i am kind of taking a little bit of a hiatus right now but i still did want to do this podcast because it sounded fun quote unquote so the main topic today is I am going to talk about The Division 2 in hindsight. So I broke this into categories um, of release, post-release content, year one, year two, uh, PvP, open world, PvE stuff uh, in the future slash year three. So the release, it's kind of hard to believe now. It's been over two years since the second game came out. Um, honestly, uh, in the back of my mind, if you had to ask me or if you had to say, you know, hey, how long ago did uh, Division 1 come out? I'd be like, oh, it's been a couple years. Um, and to sit and think about how that uh, has been five years ago now is really weird. Um you know, the, the Division franchise um, is not my first gaming franchise I've been interested in. Um, I'm, I'm almost 33. I will be on Monday, um, the 26th, and I've played games as long as I can remember. Um, my earliest memories of gaming would either be on, like, a DOS computer or an original Nintendo. Um, as I got older, I played on, like, Super Nintendo um sega uh, i had a sega saturn if you don't know what that is i believe it was one of the first disc based gaming systems and it was terrible i had two games on it daytona and area 51 it was like an on rail shooter with a controller it was a nightmare anyways i've played games for a long time i've really cared about a lot of games um while division is probably my favorite franchise um as like an adult as a as a, a grown human um, my original and probably still my most played franchise is still age of empires and specifically age of empires 2. but anyways um you know the division 2 has been out for two years now more um at this point and what's funny is the reception of the original Division um, is when I, um, I I played the open beta before Division 1 came out. I had heard of the game just like everyone else back in like 2013 and was like, holy shit, that looks dope. And then forgot about it, to be totally honest. Um, and then the open beta came out and I played it and I was like, oh, damn, like this is really cool. So I pre-ordered, I, you know, it came out, I played it the, the on release minute, um, in the first game, you know, 
it's a bummer about the first game because it had it came out in a really rough technical state and um you know there there was issues with cheating there was issues with so many issues with glitches purposeful and not um my favorite one will always be when you would climb a ladder um and your character would elevate off the ladder and you could just fly around the whole city um yeah so that wasn't a great look um I would have to go back and look at the Metacritic scores, but um, I I don't I believe the first game was reviewed very much as a like cool idea looks really nice but is kind of a shit show. And um, for those of us who have played since day one, you know, you'll remember all of the different patches. You know, one point one, one point two, I think it was one point three where it was the sniper shotties. Um, the LMB became. Uh, almost a meme at that point um, 1.4 for a lot of people was the big savior patch um, that fixed a lot of things uh, 1.6 was another one a lot of people were really into um, for me my favorite patch for division one was 1.7.1 1. um, and that's because uh, 1.7 introduced one shot uh, secret mines so that pretty much shit on pvp pretty bad uh, but they fixed that and they changed it. And what happened is there was a time where um, basically hybrid builds kind of ruled the day. And um, for PvE and PvP. And uh, the game found such a cool sweet spot for like a few weeks. Because then classified gear started dropping from the global events. And basically ruined PvP, in my opinion. Uh, beyond that, the fact it was already kind of just okay anyways but i digress so division two in comparison released and it had some technical difficulties i remember sound was an issue um you know th there were definitely some bugs but it wasn't that bad and what's interesting is if you go and you you look at the reviews of division two they're glowing um division two got a lot of really good press um from a lot of really well-known people and uh, the games industry and the game review industry um, chief among them being Greg Miller um, of kind of funny games and just kind of of his own brand as well. Who's a big uh, division fan in general um, back before division two came out. Uh, there was a, I want to say an E3 uh, interview uh, between uh, Julian Garrity, Greg Miller, and one of the devs. I honestly, it might've been Matthias Carlson. I can't remember who, but, so division two the release had a really good reception um and I, and I think people forget that um and i think people forget that that reception was important because um you know i think they've said that you know they've sold over 10 million copies of this game um and that was months ago so i imagine you know it's you know they're up a few more from that um but people have to realize that like say you sell 15 million copies of a game like 85 and i'm making this number up but a very large percentage of those people are gonna play your game like 10 to 20 hours and maybe never play it again and that's not because it was bad it's not because they didn't like it it's because the attention span of most gamers is pretty short and the division was a game one and two that you could play just through the story one to 30 or a world tier five for division two and then set it down. And, and that's what a lot of people did. And that's what a lot of people do, not just with division. I'm sure people have done that with other looters, just other games in general. And what, what people uh, in the division two community need to realize is that those of us who have played one, two, three, 400 hours, 500 hours, a thousand hours, 2000, I think I've seen people with like five plus thousand miles, uh, miles, uh, hours, you are just in such a minority of the game's community and player base. And that doesn't, it's not a bad thing. It just means that, you know, when I see someone moaning and groaning about the game and it being repetitive and not being fun and there's nothing new to do, and they have a thousand hours in the game, the, the game, as far as I can tell, from conversations I've had, isn't meant for to be played endlessly. So what happens is I think you see the people who played the game 10, 20, 50, maybe even 100 hours. 
um, and then dropped off because there was other stuff to do, have a really good impression on this game. It, it looked great. It was fun to play. It had an interesting story for those of us who don't pay too much attention to it. it I think it's probably more interesting. Um, and the reception and release of this game was really good. I will put my foot down and say that to this day, it still has the best release of any looter shooter type game. Um, any game in the genre. Um, better than Destiny, better than Destiny 2, better than, um, you know, obviously Anthem. Um, yes, you could argue Borderlands uh, 3 did better, but since that game doesn't really have, like, pvp i don't i consider that game like its own little genre but maybe that's convenient uh but i mean you're, you're looking at games like marvel's avengers you could say that outriders um has maybe taken that mantle um my issue with outriders is that um it's such a safe game that they did um and it's so different than division um and i think it does things well but i don't think it does anything actually better than any other looter um so i would definitely say outriders uh from a general perspective um maybe competes with division 2's release but division 2's release was really good and i think that gets lost sometimes in conversations um when you know a couple years later when we're all angsty and bored um you know the the relatively small number of people still uh, really involved in the game and paying attention um, but yeah, the the original release of Division 2 was, you know, the 1 to 30. I don't think they introduced the world tiers, or at least was it you could only get to world tier 4 until the title basin update, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and that experience was great, in my opinion. I'm super biased, I get that, but I thought the story was interesting. I thought it introduced some interesting characters. I think Alani Kelso is one of the best characters um, that we've ever gotten in Division. Um, I know a lot of people hate her, think she's like a, a secret bad guy um, after all this time, but I I think she's a really, just really good character. Um, so maybe that, you know, takes away some points from my opinion uh, to some of you. But, um, you know, the game came out it was pretty solid. Um, the introduction of Black Tusk in the end game, uh, I still think is really cool. Um, I, I I remember I went to two events before Division 2 released. I went to E3, which all of you know about, um, or at least anyone who's followed me for a few years. I went to E3 2018 to see the game uh, revealed, and um, I remember there was... Um, that was just really cool to see, you know, just to be part of that buzz. It was exciting. Um, what fewer of you know about, even though I have talked about it fairly often, um, is I also, I think like a month before release, uh, February 18, went, um, or February 19, yeah, um, went to San Francisco and went to a event where they, uh, revealed Black Tusk. It was the first time they had revealed them uh, or talked about them. And what I actually got to do was play in game and see what that looked like and see what that was going to be. And I just, it was great. Um, and then people finished it. <laughs> and there was a lot of backlash, I remember, about the title basin update not coming fast enough. Um, which uh, gave you oral tier five um, and, and until Warlords of New York was in game, right? And what was interesting was they, um, a, a lot of the anger was that people got to world tier four and felt like there was no reason to keep playing because in two or three weeks, this world tier five was going to drop and all of your world tier four gear was useless, which was true. And I remember that being one of the first big pushbacks from people. And, um, you know, the Division Two community devs and stuff like that, I personally think, um, you know, I've had a really hard job. <laughs> and um, for the most part, I've handled it really well. Um, but communication in this game hasn't always been ideal, right? 
So um, because of the things I know and conversations I've gotten to have, I've never actually really blamed um, the commu- the comm devs for that because um, what a lot of people don't realize is that like they don't give the comm devs like a list of topics and say, go ahead and talk about whatever you want. You know, they, my impression or assumption would be that, you know, they, they, they are given information that should be put out. Um, they obviously know about stuff before they can talk to us about it. Right. So like warlords of New York, like the day that was revealed, the comm devs didn't just find out about it that day, but there was specific direction that they couldn't talk about it until they were allowed. And what I see so often happen, um, even probably today, is how often they they know what's coming and they know the issues, but they aren't allowed to talk about them. Um, so if there's a new bug that's out, you know, they will request, you know, they'll say, hey, you know, we were going to address that bug. Um, and someone in the communications above them, whether it's from Massive, um, more than likely Ubisoft, from what I've been told, will say, no, you can't talk about that. Uh, we don't have an official reaction. We don't have a statement at this at this time, or we just don't want to address that. <laughs> so um, when, when they've caught flack so often, it's always kind of bummed me out because I don't think people realize that they, uh, uh, the comm devs would probably love to tell us everything, especially when it comes to issues. Um, they just aren't allowed. And so I remember that initial pushback on that, like, well, why would I waste time farming World Tier 4 when as soon as World Tier 5 releases, it's pointless? Um, and to a point, I think people kind of had a point. My guess is they just didn't have Tidal Basin done yet, <laughs> is that they were still, you know, there's either some big bugs that they had to fit, uh, fix or you know, the content just wasn't finished, whatever the reason was. Um, but then title, uh, you know, that first title update came out and we got title basin and I think some other stuff dropped with it, maybe some new, uh, gear sets or guns or, or there's some other features. Um, you know, that, that stuff gets a little hazy for me to be totally honest. Um, but it was our first, um, it was our first stronghold, uh, which became a, uh, you know, or no, oh, no, no, it was our first new stronghold because we, uh, to get to world tier four, you had to beat um, the Roosevelt Island. You had to be a district union and you had to take over the capital, which in hindsight is kind of weird, but we won't get into that. Um, so, you know, the title basin, I still love the title basin mission. Um, the, the, the mission it's Hornet. I thought it was really cool. Um, I just think that, uh, the invaded version I think is cool. Like I love that mission because it's a fun place to play. And um, yeah, so, and that can be said about really all of the missions. I know I've seen people say that, you know, and this kind of goes back to the whole division two uh, release at this point is like all of the missions are so good, but none of them like stand out the same way. I think they did for a lot of, especially OG players, the way like Lexington stands out. Um, I mean, like every mission in Division Two is better than Lexington, right? Just from, in, at least in my opinion, from a design perspective, a environmental design, all of that, you know. Um, but then, you know, there's just something special to a lot of OG players about farming uh, Lexington, you know, hundreds of times to get your first Barrett's chest, you know. And so Tidal Basin came out, World Tier 5 unlocked, people were finally able to... Um, you know, actually, you know, really get into the gear and, um, and start getting things that they would use for, you know, the next year. And, um, and that was received fairly well, I think. Now, somewhere in here is when I assume Redstorm dropped off the project, um, because, um, we know that Redstorm did skirmish and that they designed that and skirmish had some updates after it came out, um, and we even had one or two Terry appearances. And um, and I don't know what, um, what completely happened with that. The last big thing I remember, and I want to say this was before the first episode of year one, was there was talk of doing uh, level 510 gear 
because uh, the, the lo level cap at the time was 500 in the DZ to give some incentive to farm the DZ for everyone and not for it to just be a PvP shit show. Um, and then that got pushed back real hard and they didn't do it. And if I remember correctly, that's the last time we had them on Division 2. So and then they moved on to whatever they're doing now, which we'll leave that to the uh, to the imagination. Um and, and I'll talk specifically about PvP uh, in the DZs and Skirmish after uh, year one and two. Okay, so then year one came about. And um, one thing that's always going to kind of dig at me about Division 2's release um, and, and what Division 2 was is that episode 1, 2, and 3, they put out this like these like promo pictures and some of these materials. And um, like, like episode 1, it was Expedition. And um, if I remember correctly, the original fan art or the original concept art or cover art they put out for episode one had an agent like overlooking like a suburban neighborhood. And in hindsight, it actually had Kenley College in the background, I'm pretty sure. And I remember, uh, you know, they didn't, the biggest issue with year one was they just didn't communicate anything to us about what we should expect. So what happens with humans, but especially division fans, when you put something out like, hey, there's something coming, and maybe even like a screenshot or some concept art, but you don't give any information, they go wild with their own expectations. And I even personally remember, you know, I was thinking, okay, Expedition, my own uh, theory crafting or um, speculation about episode one of division two was like okay it's an expedition you know the cover art has this like suburban neighborhood i bet we're gonna go and do a thing where like you have a limited amount of time to go into this new play space and it's like a, it's gonna be like survival that that made sense to me so you're gonna go and you're going to uh collect materials maybe there's loot you can only get in this mode Maybe there's a chance of PvP, but you're going to be like time li time limited in some capacity. So then it released, <laughs> and the writing was on the wall. So they did a PTS, if I remember correctly, for episode one, and I remember people. I even jumped into it on PC, and I remember um, starting it up and getting into Kinley College. And being like, what? <laughs> you know? So here's the thing. Kinley College, uh, episode one did include uh, what, Camp White Oak and the national, uh, the, the zoo missions, which I'll talk, I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but Kinley College is funny because, like, when you load into it, it's gorgeous. Like, that play space is so good. And then the three places you go into, well, it's the, like the student center, uh, I think it's like the library, uh, and then the, the, the subway is just so well made. It's so pretty. The design is so cool, but then you start playing and there's a few things. So it's just a bunch of these like repetitive, like timed events with different goals. Um, the, the, the worst or one of the worst things they did with this uh, Kinley College, and it's still going today, is they they made it where Kinley was is only available during certain weeks. And what's so bad about that is that, I mean, for me, to just be straight up, I think Kinley College is like super mediocre content. It's just, it's fine. It's there. I think you play it once, you never touch it again, is my opinion. And what happens when you do this like exclusivity thing where it's like, oh, transpose waiting and not to mention how awful it is to have to hear that stupid message every time you load up anyways, is it, it gives this like air of like exclusivity or like, oh, Hey, it's available. You're so lucky to go check it out. And then you go check it out and it sucks. 
And then what happened when they released it was, in my opinion, one of the worst parts was, and this isn't the case anymore, but when they initially released episode one, you could only do one third of the Kinley missions. So it released and there's a time gate that you could finish it in, but you could only do the first part. And then you had to wait. It was like, it was at least two weeks, but it may have been more before the second part opened up. Um, maybe it was only a week. I can't remember. But long story short, they like time gated it. And if it was super cool, interesting, compelling content, that would have been okay, I guess. Because would, there would have been a lot of anticipation and hype. But the moment anyone played that first section, I wonder, I would love to see the stats of how many people played the first part of Kinley and in the last year and a half never touched it again. Because they played that first part, they're like, oh, okay, like, that's fine, I guess. Um, and then, and then never went back, um, because there was a reward. If you beat all three, um, you could go to a chapel that's on campus and get the diamond back gun. Um, which let's, let's dive into that. So one, uh, that payoff sucked because the chapel opens up and you just open it and then you leave and you never come back. Um, in my opinion, that was such a perfect opportunity for when you finish that third mission, you go to unlock that chapel. It doesn't unlock. You get an alert and you hear a bunch of smoke pop off and they're like three hunters spawn in and you have to fight them before you can do it. Whatever. Ignore me. So the diamondback. So that can get me into a discussion uh, somewhat brief about the, the guns and the gear in division two as a whole. So one thing I really liked or I really like about division two is they put a lot of time into making, well, the brands for one are, were a new thing to division two. And I think the brand sets are so good. Um, I think that's such a cool concept. It does suck that a lot of them are basically useless, but they're still there. And then they added transmog, which made it even better. So you could actually make your agent look like really cool. But what I really liked from an aesthetic point of view is that like in division one, if you remember when you hit level 30 end game, all of the high end chests looked exactly the same. Like the backpacks were all that same, like triangle backpack. Um, in division two, the end game gear all looks different. And now with transmog, you can even make your super nice end game, you know, uh, gold piece look like a, you know, gray beginning piece. Um, but what I really liked is that that gave a lot of opportunity for customization of your character, for you to really be able to be able to look the way you want to look in Division Two. Um, the character creator leaves a lot to be desired, and and the characters in general don't look great. There's a lot of stories behind that I've heard, and I can't really confirm any of them. The long of the short of it is, I'm under the impression that there was like a last minute issue with the scaling of the characters in Division Two. And that they had to like redo a bunch of stuff, maybe from scratch. And that's why the characters all look like kind of weird. Um, that's all rumor. I can't confirm any of it. Believe it or not, that's up to you. I don't care. So the gear, I think, from an aesthetic point of view, is a huge improvement over Division 1. Um, and even from a gameplay point of view, I know there's a lot of people who miss like classy striker and classy nomad and classy, you know, centuries mark and all those. Um, and I do to a point, but I also like that in division two, division two just has, uh, if we're not talking about PVP has just so much more of a wide meta that you really can in division two put together whatever you want. You can make almost anything good. And you can go into like weird like status effect builds or tech builds or all red builds or tank builds. Um, and they're not all equal. I'm sure there's a clear meta if you really look into it. But you can have fun with all of those. Again, I'm not talking about PvP. And then you get to like the guns and stuff like that. And like in Division 2, like there's just so many more guns. And they're, they're just... You know, there's definitely a meta, you know, everyone still, for the most part, obviously, depending on your build, goes towards the same, you know, a couple guns that have high RPM and decent damage, and that's just the way it goes. But they just, I think they did such a good job this time of introducing guns, you know, almost with every update, there was at least one or two new things, one or two new guns. 
Um, the final thing I'll touch on on this before I go back to episode one is uh, the specializations. And that was a big change. Um, and in hindsight, what, what I think is kind of interesting is I like the idea of the specializations. Um, I wish that you had such a big um, selection tree, skill tree, that you that you'd have to actually make a choice and that you couldn't select them all. I wish that it was a thing where you could really customize your character by the choices you make in there. And I wish that they wouldn't have done the specialization weapons because I know there's some like niche situations where they are useful and some people do use them, but I think they just look awful on the characters. I think like the grenade launcher looks okay. Um, the rifle just looks so, it's just so big. Like, and it's the fact that there's such a predominant look on your character. Cause I think the characters look better before the world tiers, before you have the specialization. Um, but I like the specialization system. So if there's ever a division three, I would sure love to see the specializations return uh, and they can be used a little more to flesh out your character. Um, but don't do the guns again or the weapons, the rocket launchers and the sniper rifle and the crossbow. It's just the flamethrower and Gatling gun. I, maybe some people will disagree with me here. That's fine. Um, but I'm cool with just my two guns. Let's just make those look really good. Okay, getting back to episode one. So Kinley, in my opinion, was just kind of a bust. Um, I've heard rumors and, and had you know some conversations where it sounds like Kinley was supposed to be a, a much bigger thing than it was. Um, but that's kind of a coulda, woulda, shoulda situation. Now for episode one, on the other hand, um, Camp White Oak and the zoo mission, I think are just incredible. Um, especially from a design point of view. Um, the zoo mission, in my opinion, is a bit long. <laughs> and for people who have done um, like the invaded version and the heroic versions and or legendary, I forget which one it is. Um, you know, that, that definitely checks out um, that me that mission can be very tedious, but simply from a viewpoint of like, this is just cool um, point of view. Um, you know, it's just hard to, uh, it, it's hard to argue that in my opinion, that it wasn't just great. Um, and uh, in the white Oak mission, I just loved it. I, I, and, and it is funny that we've played like three versions of that mission now, and they've all been against black tusk. Um, but I, I really just love the flow of that mission. And um, it's, you know, it is kind of a thing that once you play it once, you've kind of played it a hundred times. I understand that. Um, but I still, it just, uh, I don't know. I, I think it was, I think it was great. So, um, okay. So... So episode one, I wish would have been kind of more of a um, a slap in the face of, of of making people realize like this is what these episodes are going to be like. Because I remember, and even myself had had a lot of chatter about um, the division one, uh, you know, the the division two in this episode one being like, hey, this was just the first episode. I'm sure the second episode is going to be way bigger because it was looming. Right. The second um, the second expedition or the second episode was uh, the last castle. And it had this cool cinematic about it where like a drone was watching Black Tusk committing this big operation at the Pentagon. And they were digging down to the DARPA labs that are underneath it. And like, oh shit, like this is going to be so cool. And, um, and that was when we hadn't really realized that the scale of these episodes maybe wasn't going to be as big um, as we thought. And, and what's, what's kind of funny about it is that I remember when it was leading up, they did not do a PTS for this one. So this was like a fresh experience. And just like with episode one and with Kinley College, uh, but even worse this time because, you know, we didn't get a preview, is that people went wild. I thought for sure this was going to be the Underground 2.0. I thought, I had no doubt in my mind, like, okay, so we know there's two missions. So you're going to do those two missions and then it's going to open up to the Underground. Dope. 
because it makes sense because it's basically saying like the Pentagon, at least at one time was the largest floor space office building in the entire world. Um, which that doesn't make sense. It's only like a five story building, but it's extremely has a very large footprint and it's supposedly, and as this, as the game suggests has a hilariously giant and extensive underground, uh, part of uh, the facility. So the idea in my head was that there is going to be these randomly generated missions that would take place above and underground in the Pentagon where you need to go recover blueprints for this thing or this certain material or this certain piece of tech. And that's what, you know, underground 2.0 would be in episode two, the last castle. So what happened was episode two released and we got to play in it and we got to, you know, you get dropped off on on uh, I think it was on the on like the, the the riverfront, and you you fight your way to the safe house that's just outside of the Pentagon. I think the library, and then you fight to the Pentagon because there there's like there is if you if you don't remember a little bit of like an open world segment right outside of the Pentagon, and then you drop down into it, and and then you actually fight in the like basic area. There there are some enemies to fight. But then this is when it hits you, you know, so you play the two missions. I think the missions are great. I know the one on the higher difficulties is like a huge pain. Um, I think with the drone, but still like, I think it's a really cool mission. It looks so cool. Like you go through the DARPA labs and you see like these prototypes and, or you see like the tech that your shade agents are using, but then you also see all of this tech that black tusk is using. And, and there's a bunch of other stuff to talk about with that, but you start to realize that, you know, maybe the agents aren't the only one being served by pow the powers that be. And um, those missions are so cool, but then you finish them. And then you're left, in my opinion, kind of looking around like, okay, so now I go and, and do the underground, right? And you don't. Um, this comes to another point where I can say that, like, I've heard rumors that, that the, the it was supposed to be a bigger thing, and it just wasn't. And, um, and that didn't happen, unfortunately. Um, again, I can't confirm it. I have no, no sources I can actually cite um, to say that, but... Um, it was such a missed opportunity. And, and this was when, uh, it's kind of funny, but this is when I definitely went into, I think this is when I took a couple months off the game because I realized like, oh, these episodes um, aren't going to be a big deal. We aren't getting like new game modes. Uh, we got Kinley College, if you call that a new game mode. But you have to think back for OG players that in Division One, you know, we got Survival, we got Underground, we got uh, Last Stand. Uh, you know, we got all these modes in that first year, and I think everyone expected that for Division 2 as well, and that's not even close to what we got in the year one content. So after episode two, myself and I think a lot of other people were kind of like, oh, okay, so these things aren't really that big of a deal. Like, okay, I guess... Um, now, people like me were getting new story, new missions, things that I wanted from Division 1's content. Because if you remember, in Division 1, uh, other than the uh, incursions, we didn't get more story missions. The game came out and you never got... The story didn't really progress after the game came out. So with Division 2, we had the opposite problem. The story was progressing uh, extensively. Whether you like the story or not is a different discussion, but the story was continuing and, and I loved it. Um, I, I don't think it's the best told story in the world. There's so many holes and things that don't make sense, but it's, it's a world I like, and I, I like seeing it push forward. So, um, I, I have to admit that personally, episode three, I wasn't all that excited. We knew it was going back to New York City, but we also knew it was Coney Island, which isn't on Manhattan Island. And when I, there was definitely a big reservation for me of like, eh, I mean, it's episode three. Okay, whatever, I guess. Like, I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, and then that's when things started happening. And... Um, so that was in 2020, I believe. And they uh, basically were uh, dead quiet in the winter, which has always been the case for Division. And then they came out and they did a stay of the game. And the starting stay of the, uh, stay of the game graphic was black. 
it was different. And they played through this trailer, and basically we find out that um, episode three is essentially going to be a prelude to a year two content, and specifically Warlords of New York. Uh, so I will get to Warlords, I promise. Um, but for now, I am not going to uh, to dive into that quite yet. Um, but episode three, I will. And so what we found was that episode three was becoming was basically going to be a introduction of returning to New York City, um, which I honestly didn't expect. Um, I thought that there'd be a lot of places we may go that maybe they would introduce a new area of like like Boston or Philly or or something. I thought maybe there'd be a place where they'd just do more like expedition stuff where it'd be like a Kinley College type thing, but no. So what we found... Coney Island to be episode three was two new missions on Coney Island and um, it would be reintroducing the cleaners. It would be bringing Keener back into the fold. It would be um, because as far as I can remember, I don't think Keener was ever a part of division two's main story. Uh, As far as I can think, uh, Black Tusk was kind of the big baddie down there. Um, as well as all the local leaders, and you know, you know, we, they they kind of left Keener to the side. So, um, the episode three. So here's the thing about it, though: it is as cool as this was, this moment was really exciting because, and then episode three, uh, not long after it dropped, is when the Warlords came, um, which was a big deal. Um, it was only like four weeks or something. Episode three dropped, and then Warlords came not long after, and. Um, the missions are great. Again, you you had the first mission where it was took place along the beachfront and the boardwalk, and uh, let's see the stadium where you release Vitaly Kl- uh, Klitschko, uh, Vitaly uh, Trenenko. You recover him from Keener, and then there's all the mystery about like, well, why would Keener hand over Vitaly, and why would he be working with the Black Tusk? Blah blah blah. Um. Now, mind you, at this point in the story, we had recovered a bioreactor, which can um, generate um, vaccines or a vaccine for uh, the dollar flu. Uh, It was at our home base and we needed Vitaly. We needed someone who could use it. So that was the whole point of trying to recover him. And so you play through that first mission. You you recover Vitaly, you kill a bunch of Black Tusk. You find out that Keener has double-crossed Black Tusk, of course, because that's Keener. Um, So Black Tusk and you are going after Keener and trying to track him down um, in the second part of the mission where they reintroduce the Cleaners, who had such a freaking badass glow-up. The Cleaners, I think, look so cool, uh, especially the heavies, but really all of them in general just look great in Episode 3 and in Warlords of New York and now so but here's the thing episode three was still just two new missions and uh, i think a new apparel event so it was one of those things where like i think episode three gets a little more uh forgiveness because of what it was leading to but at the end of the day just to summarize my thoughts is the whole uh, year one of division two was super underwhelming it wasn't bad There were great missions. There was great stuff that happened. Absolutely. And there was a, they did a lot of things that people wanted from division one, especially with story and missions, but it didn't bring any of that, like super hype um, when it came to new modes and things like that. And I really think um, now I've had all kinds of conversations and it sounds like a lot more stuff was supposed to happen. And that's where I'll leave that. But uh, and it's just a shame because literally one new mode probably would have a lot, a lot of people look back at your one much differently. But to me, I just looked back at it extremely lacklusterly, but you know, we move on from there. So, so year two begins. So warlords of New York. So warlords of New York introduces a whole bunch of stuff. It introduces, a uh, a new map, a, a pretty large map, um, all of Lower Manhattan. I don't think it quite butts up to the Division One map, but it's really close. Um, and what's really cool about this map, and I don't know how how many people have actually ever noticed this, but a big chunk of the Warlords of New York map is a retired DZ. 
So if you ever really pay attention, I forget which part of it. I want to say like the north central part of the map is uh, it's you run through a bunch of DZ gates uh, and checkpoints and it, and you see the walls. So it's obvious that that area was a DZ at one point that just broke down. The, the, the checkpoints got blown out and it just became part of the open world. Anyways, it introduced the the um, the the targeting system, and of course, I'm um, I'm not the manhunt system. So, uh, the the whole basis of Warlords of New York is that uh, Keener had gotten these four rogue agents to come under him. They were all working with different factions. Uh, they reintroduced the Rikers, the Cleaners. Um, we did see. Let's see, Rikers Cleaners. Let's see, the uh, Rikers Cleaners. Why can't I think of the last one? Ah, I don't know. I'll think of it as I'm talking. Um, but what was really interesting was they 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 brought up this concept. So there were these four rogue agents you had to take down, and then you got to fight Keener. And so that introduced all these new missions, all these side missions. Warlords of New York, I will argue, is the best storytelling they've ever done. Whether it's the cinematics, the intro cinematic is ridiculous. Kelso looks so badass. Like, everything about that is just so cool. Um, and this, the way that, you know, the storytelling they do with the different rogue agents and explaining their backgrounds. And um, really the letdown of the whole DLC to me was that the final fight with Keener feels so like Sunday morning cartoon, like super villain kind of stuff. And his exit is just kind of lackluster to a point, but I really felt like the lead up to that was so cool. I knocked out that entire DLC in one day. I did like a 10 hour stream that day and played it from beginning to end and just freaking loved it. It was great. Um, and that introduced us to level 40. So that took the, the, the your player level from 30 to 40. It got rid of the gear score system. It introduced, they had changed, they did, they did gear 2.0, where, where stats are just done differently. You can look up the differences yourself. I'm not going to explain them right now. Um, but it just, it was so cool. And I just... I, I really, what's so funny about that DLC is it feels like, and this is pure speculation from me, it feels like that was supposed to be Division 1 uh, content, you know? And uh, that's not a bad or a good thing. It's fine, you know? Um, it's it's the fact that they they just it, it it just seems so disconnected and that was kind of something i wanted i said and and i've said a lot about the episode 1 2 and 3 um from division from the first year um and even warlords all of this content was so frustrating for me because they it just didn't feel like it was uh connected to the main game like at all um and that just it, it made it really hard to get like super excited about it um in a way because it just felt so like you would go to kinley college and recover the shade node but then nothing changed back in dc um you went to the pentagon and got the bioreactor and, and that actually did open up a new part of the White House. And you see the bioreactor sitting there humming. Um, and it's so cool. Uh, so then you're like, oh, okay, so that's going to affect something. But then it doesn't. And then you go to Coney Island and you recover uh, Trinanko. And you're like, oh, okay, so now Trinanko is going to be in that lab making antivirals. Dope. That's so cool. And he isn't. And it's a year later. And he still isn't. It's like so, and I'm sure there were plans to do more with that. Like, I'm sure there was um, some plans that you would have to, like, recover biomaterial and bring it back to Chernenko, and then he would put out antivirals, and you could, like, do something with that in the game. I, I don't know. You know, there, there's so many, you know, 
there's so many things to speculate on when it comes to that. You know, maybe one day I, I, I will, uh, I, I, I will do that, but you know, we're not doing it this time, but it's just the way that all of the DLC in this game, especially warlord just feels like it was supposed to take place in like a different timeline or before division two even starts. And I think that's why you can jump into it even right when you start the game. It's just like, I wish it just feels so disconnected. Like you go off to warlords of New York, you take down Keener, you, st you, you activate this rogue network and you come back to DC and Manny doesn't even say anything like there, ha there needed to be a cut scene where you get back and you're in there with Kelso and Manny um, and you're talking to them and you're like, man, that was crazy. You know, we just took down Keener, but now we have problems to deal with here. It could have been that simple. Um, but it's just like, nope, you just come back and he tells you that the, the, the transpo is ready to take you to Kenley. Like, that's just such a, it was such a, that was such a bummer. But Warlords of, of New York itself was great. That environment is so good. Like, people can complain about this game in a lot of ways, the balance, the content, whatever. But I will not hear anything about the sound design. The sound in this game is just ridiculous. And the environments is just, they're just so good. And as, as much of a defender as I've been about the DC map, I really do think it's great. I think the DC map is so good. And the fact that it's one-to-one -one scaling and it's just so like cool. I, I think that the DC map deserves so much more love than it gets. I think if they just made it winter there, people would love it even more. I will say that going back to New York and being in those like canyons between all these gigantic, unbelievable buildings, it was really freaking cool. And it was very nostalgic in that way. Um, so yeah, so Warlords was great. I still think that's the best content they've ever put out for a division game. Uh, I would, I would say, um, and what that led to was this new season system. And what we found out is that over the next year of content for year two, we'd be getting seasons one through four. And what those were going to be were essentially new manhunts. So there'd be four new lieutenants and then a final big bad to fight. And each one, I think the, I think each season lasted like six weeks or something like that. I know they had to fudge the weeks a little bit to make it work, but, um, you know, they, they, they did the thing. Um, and, and season one came out and I remember, um, there was kind of, there's the, there's the system where we got this new shade level system where you would, you would, you know, it was, a, it was another bar that you would build up and when you hit um, when you hit max, went to the next shade level, you could boost one of your stats a little bit or get materials, whatever. And in theory, the system was supposed to bring some kind of like, quote unquote, like endless ability to play the game. It doesn't really do that, but that's fine. Um, and so the season one comes out and uh, you're taken down, uh, I think it was Jupiter or something like that, it was the first rogue boss. Uh, you know, when Keener dies, he activates the rogue system and she's like the head of these new rogues. So you take out her four lieutenants um, all around the DC map, I think. I can't remember. I can't remember off the top of my head which map she was on. Um, it was probably New York. Um, anyways, and then you fight her in a modified version of a stronghold and it's super cool. Um, you get some cool new gear there. They introduced the battle pass system where there's a free track and a premium pa uh, pa path that everyone got free with warlords for the first uh, episode or first season. And it was great. Um, I was actually really motivated. I did all the things they introduced, uh, like the, the, the time trial stuff. And I was super into it. I, I leveled to level 100, got all the bits and bobs and all the cosmetics and all the, the, the gear drops and all that super into it. Really cool. Um, and I, it, the, the thing is the whole is that this rogue, this final boss that you finally got to, um, because again, like Kenley, this content was time gated. So you had like three or whatever weeks for the first Lieutenant and then the second Lieutenant and then the third and then the fourth. And then you got to fight the final big bad. And then you had to wait until the next season, which didn't feel great in my opinion. Um, I, I felt like it was very artificially dragging out, um, but that's fine. That's the way it was. So then season two comes and it's Hornet. 
And so they did this goofy thing where they decided to make this story of after you killed Hornet at the Russian consulate in Division 1, Keener swept in with some medics and saved him. He actually didn't die. And this was weird because it was rewriting um, some history. So it was a whole new voice actor. Um, and it seems like they changed everything about the character. They did give him some backstory. I think the idea was that he was in the special forces with Keener and they were really close and, um, and all that. But um, it was fine, I guess. Um, the final mission takes place in Tidal Basin, which I thought was a lot of fun. I thought was pretty cool. Um, all of these seasons also culminate with you getting a new skill mod. That was something that they um, introduced with Warlords of New York was bringing back like the sticky bomb and doing like a decoy and some other stuff. And um, I've never actually ended up using any of the mods I got from Warlords, <laughs> um, but that's probably more me than the game. And the the Hornet mission was fine. Um, the The cool thing about this for me, from a story perspective, was that there's a bunch of new um, comms that came with all of these um, that explained the story, explains the background, did some cool stuff kind of hinted to what was coming in the future. Um, but season two, I was just kind of lackluster to me on top of the fact that the way that they time gated the lieutenants and stuff like that, it just, this is when I started to feel a little bit worn down. I was still leveling to a hundred. I was still completing the content, but I was definitely like coming in, doing all the stuff and then being gone for like two weeks, coming in, doing all the stuff and then being gone. Uh, season three comes out and our target was Barden Shaper, who's the head of the Black Tusk Special Forces unit. Um, he was the one who was working with Faye Lau, who at the end of Warlords of New York, we killed Keener. Faye, uh, quote unquote, betrays Shade and goes to work for the Black Tusk. And um, Barden was the one who she was working with. And so we uh, go through all the rig rigmarole uh, with Barden, and then we fight him in one of the Coney Island missions, which is super cool because his mission includes a guaranteed fight against the hunter that he dispatches to attack you and now starts to lead us down the path of the, the hunters are part of black tusk or they're at least allied with them in some capacity. We still don't know. I kind of hope we never find out because I can't imagine it's going to be a explanation that I'm going to love. But anyways, we actually don't kill Barden Schaefer. Uh, we take Barton Schaefer as a hostage. He's alive, or at least that's what's implied at the end of the mission. Um, and now, months and months later, there's no explanation of that. I assume whatever content is coming in the future will say what Barton's up to. <laughs> I don't know. If we're going to turn him to our side or whatever, we'll have to wait and see. Then season four comes out, and this is the one that I think most people were anticipating because we knew that this final manhunt target was going to be Fei Lao. Um, after her betrayal, it was going to be like, okay, well, let's go get her back. And another uh, character who had been introduced during this time was Natalia Sokolov um, of the brand that you wear in the game. Um, but she basically, we figure out that she is the, the person in charge of Black Tusk. And, uh, in fact, one of her, her brother is an agent who goes rogue and is one of the lieutenants for Fei Lao. And he actually ends up being my favorite lieutenant of all four seasons. His voice acting is super cool. Um, yeah, I thought I loved his whole shtick. Except for when you get to his, when you do all of his tasks to get to fight him, um, I don't know if it's fixed yet or i guess we won't know until they rerun season four but his his fight was bugged and it took place uh this season or this episode or whatever his couple his three weeks or four weeks was over the winter between 2020 and 2021 and his mission is completely bugged out and he just he was the, he was just an easy kill he, his character just sits there and yells at you and you kill him and it's over Huge bummer for me because he was easily one of my favorite characters they've introduced, um, even as a fairly small part of it. Um, oh, and one of the other agents we kill, uh, that's one of her lieutenants, Faye's lieutenants, is the daughter of the guy in the gun range. And I thought for sure 
we were going to kill her and then go back to the White House and find just some random NPC in the gun range because we murdered his daughter. But no, he's still there. It's it's again, it's just disconnected. There's there's no connection between the game and the things that we're doing. And that, as you can tell, is a thing that over and over again has is one of the remaining issues for me at this point. Anyways, we get to the final mission. You fight Faye. Um, you go through the, the Camp White Oak mission again. Um, you get to the final mission. Uh, you find that Faye has killed the current president. Um, and then some weird stuff happens. So you get to the end of the mission. You fight Faye. You kill her. And she's dead. No matter what some people think, it's not another Schaefer situation. Faye gone. Just deal with it. But when you replay the mission and you finish up the comms, the comms are apologies from Faye to different people um, from Division One for, for betraying. But what you find out is that she didn't actually betray the Shade. She infiltrated Black Tusk to kill the president because he was obviously not an appropriate leader for the Shade Network, for the Division. But, so here's the thing. So the way I've justified this is that my assumption is that she really wasn't a traitor. So you go through the mission and you find out that she killed the president. And there's a moment where she says, this is why I was here. You know, and, and from this voice comm, you now know she wasn't really, she didn't really betray the shade network, you know, the division. She just needed to kill that president so that the, someone more appropriate could actually be in charge of division. Right. But here's the thing. So basically it sounds like because Kelso or our agent decides to keep pursuing Faye, we have to kill her. It's one of those maddening things because I've talked about it before, but all they had to do, and this is going to be a super gamer moment of like, well, all they had to do was this one simple thing. And, but bear with me. If the way that that final mission with Faye went was we get to that, uh, to the cabin, president's dead she should be there with her hands up saying hey i only did this to, to get rid of him i knew i could get close to him and kill him um if you don't trust me that's fine but we both need to get out of here because they're sending their best people to come kill you and me and then we fight with her all of the kelso mission from the hotel and when the game first came out we we escort her and then we extract with her and then it turns into a whole thing of like well can we trust her like but then that that character didn't have to die and she shouldn't have died because the fact that she makes it clear to us she didn't really betray us but then that we still kill her there's just no good storytelling there and what's the most maddening thing about it is that in the preview for season four, they had the trailer and that trailer involved a cutscene where Faye is, has her hands up. She's surrounded by agents, presumably the four agents in your party. And your agent is running, is walking up to her and, and cocks their hand back to punch her. So I am like, conspiracy theory here but i am positive that the, the ending i'm talking about where we would capture her or not kill her was the original plan but my guess and from what i've maybe or maybe not been told is there's just basically at this point just no one left to work on this mission and that the mission went the way it did because that's all they had time for which is just such a, it's so frustrating because they showed us a trailer that showed it seemed like it was pretty obvious. That's not the way the mission was supposed to go. Um, because at no point in that mission is there a cutscene where she walked up to us with her hands up and we punch her in the mouth. So, like, obviously that was a cut story arc or a piece of the game. And instead, we just go kill her because that's what happens. Uh, and it just sucks so bad because it shouldn't have been that way. And if they didn't have the time or the resources to do it the right way, I just kind of honestly wish that they would have just had her escape on a helicopter. And then in a division three or in a year three piece of content, we can have a moment where we're like vetting her to find out if she really did betray us or if she really did just do that to kill the president. I don't know. She takes off into the woods for all I care, but no, instead we we went and we killed her. So so that wrapped up year two, um, and what was interesting was um, at that time, we were under the impression that Division Two was 
essentially done. Um, there, there were statements that came out and even official statements basically saying, I think it was 12.10 or whatever patch it was, was the final patch for Division 2. And they would maintain it, but that was going to be it. Um, and then we got news that there was going to be Year 3 content, which I'll talk about at the end of this thing. Uh, so to quickly touch on things, um, you know, the PvP in this game, um, I played a lot of PvP in the first game, despite what people may say. For Division 2, um, I really was into it at first. I played in the beta, I played in the closed beta as well, and the time to kill was like super fast when the game first released and in the beta stages, and it was awesome. Because it wasn't any of this crap where it was people dancing around and exploiting things and doing all this stuff. It, it felt like a shooter. It felt like a PvP shooter game. Well, then, you know, a bunch of the very lovely and very well thought out people in the PvP community did not like that. They they missed, quote unquote, running servers. And um, it, it really sucks that, that the devs relented so much to that idea of, like, not allowing the agents to feel like they could actually be powerful against each other. And instead, essentially going back to the old, the Division One situation of basically one meta build, everyone runs the exact same thing, and whoever shoots first or, you know, wins. You know, there's there's no, there's no point of using cover. There's no point of, you know, trying to vary your builds. It's just basically do these, you know, these this very small number of meta builds, just like, you know, Predmark, Nomad, and Striker from Division One uh, at the end. And, um, and it's, I, for me, it sucked. Um, a lot of people hated the DVs, the fact that there were three of them, um, with one being um, invaded or whatever they called it, uh, where it would rotate and it was higher level enemies. The, the rules for rogueness was different. Um, I did level my character up to the max DZ level. I played a decent amount of it. Um, mostly PvP focused because the PvE or uh, the PvE focused. Um, the PvP was okay, I guess. Um, there's still diehard people who are super into it, and that's great. Um, but I just think the DZ has just been kind of wasted content. Um, I'll, especially because it, we now know that Red Storm wasn't involved in it almost since right after release. And I think that Massive has shown very little desire to really get into that part of the game um now on the other hand skirmish actually got a ton of attention before the game came out and i really did believe at one point um i still think that skirmish is a much more attractive version of pvp for way more players the dz is kind of a thing for a fairly small number of people but skirmish really should have been a thing for a lot more people um, and I played a good, num I played a decent amount of it right when the game came out, um, and then kind of dropped off pretty quickly because it just turned into the same thing and it just hasn't gotten attention. They did add a new mode at one point, um, which was like, a you know, you get one life basically. And it was kind of a fight to the end, which did make people, I played it a little bit. People played a little more cautiously and stuff, but not enough uh, the pvp just needs attention even if i don't really look to the division two for my pvp i it would be nice if it got attention from someone um and then to hit some kind of miscellaneous topics i saw the big one would be hunters for me so division two um, did continue hunters um, but in kind of a weird way so Division 1 introduced Hunters in the survival mode, which was like the perfect implementation. Your character was rarely ever decked out when you fought them, so it was always a fun fight. They were very creative in the way they fought you. Um, even when they introduced them to the underground, I thought they were awesome uh, because I ran a somewhat underpowered tech build, um, so they were still really fun to fight. Um, the legendary implementation of the Hunters in Division 1 was disgusting. Um, they made them work with LMB, but made sure to say it wasn't canon, and then just made them bullet sponges and didn't actually make them more difficult to fight. Um, so in Division 2, they introduced this thing with the main game and Warlords, where Hunters would... You would have to get... You, you would only fight them by doing puzzles and unlocking them and getting their mask and at first this was really cool so there were these ciphers that you had to figure out and all this stuff the problem is is that one many of the hunter puzzles are 
hilariously tedious. Some of them go so far as to require you to have to wait for like night and day cycles, and it's just a, a nightmare. For people who are into that, that's super cool. Uh, and it's cool the first time, but once you do it once, and especially once you fail it, it's super tedious to do it again. I was, I'm not a fan of this implementation of hunters. Um, and it sucks because you just, you fight, once you kill them, they're gone. Um, and the only other way to fight hunters at this point, um, other than those puzzles, uh, is the top of the summit. And that's not exactly what most people want to do to be able to play content like that. At least not in my opinion. Um, and so what's, what's really annoying about it is that there is a mechanic in the game where hunters will like stalk you. So if you're out at night in DC, I don't think they do it in New York. I could be wrong. But if you're out late at night um, in the game, You'll, your your UI will start to fuzz and you'll get like these weird like clicks and stuff. And if you look around, somewhere around you, there's a hunter watching you. And what's so annoying about it is that, um, so there was a side mission in the base game of Division 2 that directly involved the hunters. So you go to help this agent who has a distress signal. You get there, he's strung up from the ceiling and a hunter attacks you. And the whole point is that he's supposed to stun you walk up to you and then run away. And it's supposed to be like, okay, so these dudes are here. It's supposed to be like an introduction. So after that, these hunters will start to stalk you in the regular game. The problem is, is that I, I have to imagine at some point that was supposed to lead to them eventually starting to actually attack you. But someone left the team or a budget got cut somewhere and they just never do. So what happens if you attack these stalkers is they just disappear. They, they poof into a, uh, into a smoke cloud and you never get to fight them and it's such a missed opportunity where if i could run around the open world doing control points and stuff and fight hunters randomly that would attack me while i'm running from control point to control point i would absolutely do that because what they did add with um warlords of new york is that like if you're doing a control point the very last wave of the defense part of the control point can spawn two rogues that can be really hard to fight and it's it's ai controlled rogues and they are so fun to fight um there's even instances where you can run into these rogues just in the open world they'll just be walking around and you can start to fight them and they give really high tier uh, loot and they can even spawn in missions so it's so funny that the system that they use to introduce these ai rogues which is so cool i love it they could it's basically what they also should have done for hunters but for whatever reason they didn't um i understand that hunters can over be oversaturated uh, i think they've already kind of done that especially by giving us hunter cosmetics which i think look awful and don't make any sense but i'll digress um hunters were like a big thing for me the other kind of miscellaneous topic which to some people is going to be like a travesty that i'm putting it in this situation but is the raids um the raids seemed like a cool idea my issue with the raids in hindsight is that the raids require eight people, which is two more than what a game like Destiny requires for similar content. But Destiny, whether you like it or not, is a way more popular game and sustains way more player population than the, the Division. So finding six people to do a raid is easy peasy, super deep, super duper easy in that community because there's so many people into it. Like it or not, the Division is more of a niche game than that. And so the fact that they did raids and required eight players, to me, was just insane. It's just wild that that they that they did more players, especially because there's no in-game LFG system. Let me be very clear. I'm not saying in-game matchmaking. That would definitely be a nightmare. But an in-game LFG system where you could like specifically like put in like targets or requirements for people to join, uh, requiring a mic, requiring other things. Um, and at the end of it, it's obvious that there was probably supposed to be a third raid. Now we only have two. I'm not expecting a third one. Uh, Ubisoft, I think, and the C did those. And they are no longer on Division. So they aren't doing more raids. Um, the raids are, like, so good. They look so good. Like, their environments are amazing. Uh, the mechanics they introduced are really cool. Um, 
but they aren't connected to the story in any way, shape, or form. And I know for a lot of people who just want to play the game, they don't care about that. But the raids, to me, just seemed like they were content that was specifically developed for Twitch. And it worked in the first raid. There were so many, like, I saw streamers, like, kind of funny, had a group that played the first raid. There were all all of these big, well-known groups. Um, it boosted the Division viewership big time with that first raid. But what happened is a lot of those people weren't, like, diehard Division players. And the way that that first raid was, it was a huge DPS check. And most people weren't up to it. And what happened is most of the groups I saw playing that first raid never got past the first boss. Um, and then it took a while for the first group to beat it. And then it took like weeks for the first console group to beat it. But that's a whole different conversation. And what was so funny about it is what happened is because of that. And then just because of the way that the year one episodes went, um, when that second raid finally came, cause it was delayed, it was just like a fart in the wind from a, if their goal was to be a big Twitch thing, to make the raids a big event, the second one was a huge failure. And then on top of that, what ended up happening is that some documents came out where someone had data mined the raid before it came out um, because it was like available for like a few minutes because of a mess up in the patch. And so someone data mined it and made this big document basically that had figured out a lot of the mechanics. And when that came out, there was a lot of accusations about most of the groups that beat the raid first using it. And there was, there was this weird moment of like, Oh, we are aware of that and we're looking into it and then nothing. So there's a pretty good chance that at least in some capacity, you know, this big event was completely marred by people abusing something uh, to do it. And instead of accountability, there was just, uh, I think it was Chris Gansler at the time. He's not even on the game anymore. Um, there was like this thing of like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll look into it. And then just nothing. And at the end of the day, who cares? It's done. It's gone. It's over. Um, you know, no one really cares anymore. But I really think those raids uh, were a pretty big detriment to the game. If we could have gotten like four, four player incursions, instead of two raids, I think that would have been a hundred times better for the game because those incursions would, could still be super difficult, but they bring a, a normal four player, um, player count, which most people can put together way easier than eight. And it would have just been more accessible to more people. Um, and in a game like division where you end up with kind of a niche number of people playing your game different than destiny, just the idea of, of making this so focused on having eight players. It's just, I don't know. I think it was a big mistake, but I'm happy to hear people who, uh, who disagree. Okay. So the final part here is talking about the future and where we're going. So we don't know much. So anything I say is speculation. Um, the only things that we know are that Yannick and a, um, the lead of the Ubisoft Romania studio, I believe, or he was at one point, um, and some other studios that have been unnamed are basically building from the impression I'm under a brand new division team from scratch, um, to make year three content and that that content will include a new mode and other stuff. And that's what we know. So, um, you know, we've, we've still seen people like trick MC talking about the game a bit. Um, uh, knowing that Yannick is still on is actually really cool. Unfortunately, we also know that people like Hamish, um, and, and others in the comm dev team, um, as far as I know, like Taylor, uh, Ella, all of them have moved on to new things. So my guess is that they're moving on to like Avatar and Star Wars, um, the, the, the new projects that, um, Ubisoft and Massive are working on. Um, they may not be, I don't know. I haven't asked and it's probably none of my business. They probably can't say anyways, but, um, what it could be. So the new mode, I literally have no idea. I, I, I don't think it's going to be like a survival thing or it's probably not going to be like an underground type thing. They claim it's a brand new mode to the franchise. So it's going to be something we've never had before. So we've had wave modes, we've had survival, we've had, you know, we've had all those things. So I don't know. <laughs> I really have no clue. 
Um, I do hope maybe they implement some cool new stuff um, with the PVE side of things. Maybe they they update DC to match like the post Warlords of New York story in some capacity. Um, stuff with hunters would be really cool. I still think a perfect opportunity for year three would be to rebuild the castle settlement. Um, and I've had lots of ideas about that, but I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Um, I, one thing I actually do hope, and I know some people will be surprised by this. I really hope it involves some type of big PVP, uh, kind of refresh of some capacity. The thing I've come to the conclusion of is you're never going to fully satisfy this community when it comes to the PVP. That's it's not going to happen because you're never going to, if you satisfy people like me, you're going to piss off people that currently like it. If you make them happy, you're probably going to make me mad. So at some point I would just like to see them do something with the PVP. Maybe it makes it a little more attractive to me and to other people. I don't know, but just something. Now, they're not going to redo the whole map. They're not going to make it to 1DZ. They're not going to do any of those crazy ideas. Um, but when it comes to this entirety of the year three content, the one thing I will say is that Ubisoft wouldn't invest the money and the time into building an entirely new team for the game if they were just going to put out like some new seasons. So I'm actually not expecting more seasons. I think whatever they put out is going to be more substantial than that. I think it'll probably be less substantial than Warlords. So I don't know what the content will be, but my guess is it's going to fall somewhere between the seasons and Warlords. So take that for what you will. If you have any ideas or what you think it might be, let me know. I'm definitely curious. Well, we are currently on, I believe, the longest podcast I've ever done. So I'm actually going to end it here. Um, when it comes to content updates, I'm basically taking a little hiatus from streaming. Um, there's stuff happening eventually that I think will actually bring me back to basically what I was doing before. Two, three streams a week, probably a weekly podcast. I'll have to, uh, we'll have to wait before we talk about what that means, though. Um, if you're a sub or if you were, if you do want to support, like I said, there's Patreon, patreon.com slash Bond Diesel. If you don't want to do that, though, check out my pinned tweet on my Twitter. Um, it's just at Bond Diesel. Um, I, do, I am doing a 2021 all year and extra life campaign um, to support my local children's hospital. Please check that out if you if you want to support in some capacity. Um, I will still honor the goals that are in there. So there's goals for streams and stuff like that. I'll definitely still do that. So um, if we hit those goals, I'm more than happy to uh, to jump back on and, and do some fun stuff. Um, but that's where I'm going to wrap it up. So I am Bond Diesel on Twitch. If you want to check me out on there, uh, I will be back eventually, I promise. On Twitter, I am at Bond Diesel and at the Echo Cast. Um, if you want some cool Echo Cast or Bond Diesel merch, check out streamlabs.com slash Bond Diesel. And that's all I have. So until next time.